All right, thanks everyone. I'm gonna come down here. Uh, so first thing is you guys should have a stack of papers at each of the tables. Let's distribute those to everyone. And uh, we may have some AV people come up during my talk, don't worry. It's okay, just come up. This is gonna be very interactive and hopefully more self-reflective. All right, so everyone's got one of those sheets. Share it. All right, so I'm Teresa Smith. I am, um, as Caroline said, the residency program director at SUNY Downstate Kings County in Brooklyn. I'm also a clinical assistant dean and the education fellowship director. Um, I did not have the fortune of being a chief resident, um, but taking the position as an APD very early on in my career, it was basically like being a chief resident. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about wellness. Wellness equaling balance, so really the lack thereof, which leads to burnout. All right, let's see if we can get this. There we go. So what happens with burnout? You have this stressor, usually it's an acute stress, and your body wants to balance itself, right? So you go through this fight or flight response, an alarm reaction. And the body's means of going back to a state of equilibrium is to usually reset, recoup, and have a new balanced state. Or you go through this chronic stress, chronic reaction, a fight or flight, and then you get exhaustion, right? And so exhaustion leads to burnout. Now this term, burnout, what do you guys think burnout means? We've heard it, right? It's in the mass media now. It's pretty popular even in scientific journals. What do you guys think burnout? What is the definition of burnout? Anyone? Burnout. I'm sure you guys are probably feeling it already in your first couple of months of being a chief resident. What do you think burnout is? Decreased like effort to go out there, decreased like enjoyment of actual work. Yes, so you're not as empathetic towards other people, right? You're not enjoying your work. Anyone else? Burnout. Is it depression? Is it not being able to, you know, function in your daily activity? No, right? It's this chronic state of trying to balance yourself to keep up with the chronic stress. So a professor, Herbert Fredenberger, came up with the coin, this term burnout in 1974. And what he said was that it's emotional exhaustion, right? It's this depersonalization. And it's a sense of a reduced personal accomplishment. You feel like you're running on the treadmill, but you're really not getting anywhere, all right? So how are we doing as emergency medicine? Well, we are leading the pack. This was a survey that was done of practicing emergency physicians, and they found that 59% actually met criteria for burnout. Did you guys know that before choosing this as a specialty? When I chose emergency medicine, it was actually a wonderful specialty, right? Because you had shift work, you could have another life. It wasn't always about work. You could make a decent amount of money. It wasn't too much money. Um, and it was relatively easy to get into, so you weren't stressing yourself trying to match. But now it's become one of the most popular specialties. It's extremely competitive to get into, and we're not lasting. Many of my colleagues actually within the last year have switched life careers. Literally started to go to locums from academics. Academic was the thing that you did. Fellowship was the thing that you did to stay and have some longevity in your career. Many people are cashing out, right, for a variety of reasons. They want to control their own work-life schedule. They want to make a little bit more money because they've got a lot of loan debt. This is a huge problem in medicine but particularly in emergency medicine. Also, we see the worst aspects of society, right? We see the things that go horribly wrong. When I see my neighbors and they say, oh, can I come visit you? You know, um, can I come see you as a physician? And I'm like, you never want to see me as your doctor. Never. Because that means that something is horribly wrong. 
So how are we dealing with this? Not so great as emergency physicians. How do we do in residency? So there is uh, an article back in 2014 in uh, Academic Emergency Medicine, and they specifically wanted to look at how are residents in emergency medicine doing with burnout. And so uh, they surveyed eight programs. Uh, it was a mix of programs, county programs, DO programs, academic programs. They had about a total of 218 residents. They got a 75% respondent rate, which isn't bad. And they found that 65% of the residents met criteria for burnout. And I'm sure you guys have had this at some point throughout your residency where you felt a bit exhausted. 65%. Now, you guys are the people that are taking care of the patients. That's what makes it so dangerous, right? And so in another article in the British uh, Medical Journal, they found that the problem with burnout is that it leads to physical and emotional damage. And if not really corrected, if you don't reset yourself, what you end up having is mental disorders. We'll just call them mental disorders, including depression. And so they surveyed a hospital, and they found that in this one hospital, there were about 15%, one-third of the doctors qualified and said that they had some sort of mental disorder, right, when they surveyed them. And that could be a variety of things, PTSD, depression, actual diagnoses like bipolar, um, and other substance abuse. And of those 15%, 80% attributed their mental disorder to work-related stress. That's huge. And if you're not depressed yet, I'm, I'm sure we're all getting there. You guys remember the screening for depression, Siggy Caps? Right? I want, and I really want this to be self-reflective because if you guys can do this for yourselves, you can do this for your colleagues. Let's go through them, all right? So sleep deprivation, too much sleep, maybe. Interest loss, guilt. You feel worthless. Now, this is throughout your residency training. Have you had time periods where you felt like this, right? Energy loss, cognitive decline, or you can't really concentrate. Appetite loss or gain. Psychomotor agitation or psychomotor retardation. And maybe even suicidal thoughts. Many of us, if not almost the entire room has gone through some part of screening for SIGI caps during our residency training, right? And we are the doctors who are taking care of the patients. It's quite, quite dangerous, in fact, right? This is an epidemic that we should be dealing with within the medical society. All right, so this is our turning point. That was extremely depressive. That's the statistics, and I'm already depressed thinking about it. Yes, we are all burned out. The point of the talk today wasn't to talk about burnout, really, but to talk about how we can prevent it. More importantly, as chief residents, how you can recognize it amongst your colleagues so that you can be a support system for them. All right, so Jay Kaplan, um, an emergency physician, wrote this wonderful article in ASEP News, and it was called Preventing Burnout. And he gives some really concrete tips of what we can do. And we're going to use this worksheet um, to kind of do, again, a self-reflective moment of how we can prevent burnout. And one of the first steps he says is a renewal investment plan, which means, okay, you're, burnt, you're feeling a bit burned out. You really don't know what the next steps are. You were questioning why you even went into emergency medicine or questioning why you even volunteered to be chief, uh, right? And so you need to take a step back and recenter yourself, rebalance yourself. So, the first two questions on this sheet of paper, and again, this is all for yourself, are what are your personal goals? The second question is what are your career goals? And let's make it concrete. Let's just say for the academic year 2018-2019. Think of one personal goal, one career goal. And we'll take about a minute just to think about that.
All right, some of the other tips, we'll come back to this. And if we have any brave souls to share, we'll share some of our, our goals. So some of the other tips that uh, Dr. Kaplan provides are take care of your health. And this is extremely, extremely important. To see a doctor that's not you, right? Doctors are the worst patients. They self-diagnose, you get one of your friends to write yourself some prescription for some antibiotics, right? Or you write it in your spouse's name and then you go and pick it up, we've all done that, right? Take care of yourself, actually get a checkup. And this doesn't just include your physical, which is probably relatively easy, but your mental. Many of my colleagues, myself included, have said the best thing that we did for ourselves was to see a therapist. It's not a shameful thing. It's actually extremely, extremely therapeutic, right? Set yourself up for a therapy appointment. Don't be ashamed. More specifically, you should encourage your colleagues who may be having a rough time to seek professional help. Identify the source of stress. Is it the fact that you're not really confident clinically? And so every time you go into work, you're having an anxiety attack. Is it you're having some issues in your personal life with your spouse? You're not home enough. You're not seeing your newborn kid enough, right? Identify where the source of this chronic stress is. You may be able to fix it right away, or you may be able to at least adjust, right? And compromise somewhere in life so that you can get back to this state of equilibrium. Create a positive work environment. You can't be the person coming into work, especially as a chief resident, coming into work, complaining all the time, because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're the guy complaining all the time, negative things are gonna happen to you, right? You're gonna feel negative, and you're just gonna go around in this cycle with this black cloud following you everywhere. Create a positive environment. If yesterday was a shitty day, come in to the next day, as something wonderful. We're gonna have a great shift today. It's gonna to be amazing, right? Because if you relay this positive energy, positivity will come to you. Relax. When it's time to take a vacation, take a vacation. Have your other chiefs cover you. Don't answer your email. Don't answer your phone. Actually relax. And this is very difficult for me, I gotta be honest. I respond to text messages within seconds. But it's extremely important. I can tell you that I am a bitch of a person right before vacation. I am not a good doctor. I'm probably not just a good human being, period, right? Especially like that night before vacation, you're just like, forget it, I don't even care. But right after vacation, I am the most creative and innovative person. You enjoy work again, you can think creatively about solving issues, whether it be in the clinical environment or in any other arena, right? You're like, oh, life is great. That's because you needed that vacation. So take a break. Many of us may have seasonal affective disorder. And we need to schedule our breaks during that time period so that we're not making everyone miserable during the winter months. Whatever it may be, take a break and fully take the break. Commit yourself to that vacation. And even if it's a day off or it's the weekend, make sure you do that as well. Because these little short time periods will allow you to press the reset button for yourself. Talk to loved ones. Now, this has a little bit of a caveat in it. How many of you guys, uh, significant other, they're in medicine? All right, maybe about half. Now, this is probably the person that you talk to about what's going on at work, a bad case you had or an interesting case. And honestly, whomever the person is that you talk to about work, that's great. Maybe it's your work wife, your work husband, your actual wife or husband, that's fine. You need someone to be able to vent to about your clinical cases. But you also need a group of people or someone else to talk to about non-medical things, right? For those who are, you know, their spouse is in medicine, that can become a huge cycle of just talking about medicine 
everywhere, right? You go out to dinner with a group of your friends and you're talking about a case. You cannot do that. There needs to be conversation that's outside of medicine. And in fact, if your spouse is not in the medical career, you might want to think about that. Because what you're doing is you're always talking about work. And that could be very straining to some relationships. But it's important. It's important to have a group of people that you can talk to, both about medical things and non-medical things. And oftentimes what happens and where people get wrapped up into this you know, cycle of sadness is they have no one to talk to. They have no one to vent to. And finally, change your perspective, right? It's very, very important. And there was a video, um, they're going to see if we can get it to play. But it's a, it's a little kid who's basically saying, practice joy. If you practice negativity, you're going to be really, really, really good at it. You're going to be the expert complainer. It could be sunshine outside, rainbow, perfect weather, but you are the expert at negativity. And that's all you're going to do. But if you practice joy, you're going to get really, really, really good at it. You will be the joyful person, the person that people will seek advice to because somehow they're smiling. Maybe they can help me figure it out. Change your perspective, whatever that may be. All right, let's go back to the worksheets. Where are you on the balance beam of life? Right now, where are you? From 1 to 10 personal life to work life. Where do you think you fit? Draw a vertical line We you think your number is. Think about it for a second. Be honest with yourself. No one's going to see this. This is for you to keep. This is all self-reflective. Where do you think you are? I'd say I'm about an eight, in all honesty. I am not doing this work-life balance thing very, very well, right? But you got to think about it. OK, if I'm at an eight now, what can I do to center myself a little bit? Constantly going through this mind game with yourself throughout the year will allow you to kind of shift yourself back into balance. All right, so on this piece of paper, it says the balance. I want you guys to think about what are your current challenges in your personal life and your career. Think about some challenges that you're facing. Write it down. What, are, what is a current challenge? One word thought that comes to your mind. I think I heard someone over here say schedule, the scheduling. Yes, I'm sure that's a current challenge for at least half of you. What's a current challenge in your personal life? Is it your finances, student loan debt, dating can be difficult as a professional, especially in emergency medicine, you're at all kind of crazy hours, right? Think about it. Now I want to take an extra two minutes because I feel like this is a, a extremely important. I want you to name one way that after this SAM conference, SAM conference, you're going to tackle both of those challenges, the personal life challenge and the career challenge. Just think to yourself, what's one thing that you're going to do to help tackle that challenge? Is it setting aside time in your calendar to do the schedule, but that's not on the weekend so that you can be with your family? Is it exercising more and making sure you set an alarm clock at 7 a.m. or whatever it is, 5 a.m., to make sure you go for a run before you start your shift? What's, and I don't, let's not make this like fluffy. Like make it a concrete thing that you're going to do to tackle the challenge. So one thing that I encourage and we all have calendars, and I'm sure we live off of our calendars. And you know, you'll stick to your calendar, right? You'll come in for your 7 a.m. shift because that's what's on your calendar. You'll go in for that 2 o'clock meeting because that's what's on your calendar. You have to schedule life on your calendar, too. 
right? So if you're trying to go to dinner with your college friend and you guys keep putting it off, put it on your calendar. No, we're going to do this. We're going to go out Thursday at 6 p.m. It's on my calendar. We are the most loyal to our calendars. If you really want to work out and you've been trying to figure out how to, to get the routine in, put it on your calendar. Right? Put a break on your calendar. If you've been studying for your boards and preparing for it and you're just, it's all you're doing all day long, put a break on your calendar. We're all type A people and so you know, really sticking to the calendar and being loyal to the calendar really does help you balance out your life. So now finally, the last segment of this worksheet is extremely important. And, and um, before we fill it out, um, I will say this. So every year in my residency program, um, for the last, I would say, three years, we have a session where we talk about wellness and burnout, and really it's suicide prevention. I used to call it the suicide prevention talk. Uh, and the point of it was to make sure that the residents knew locally who they could call if they didn't feel comfortable calling us if they were having thoughts of suicide. So we provide the local campus numbers for uh, psychiatry department, the national hotlines. I would encourage everyone to do this at their program at least once a year. And so when I first did this, I thought it was going to be really hokey. Um, but I, I got a lot of information out of it. So now this last question says, name three people that you can call in times of acute stress. Something horrible has happened. You broke up with your significant other, getting a divorce, parent died. Name three people. This could be people at work, at home, a family member, but you have to fill it up with three people. Think about how you would contact them. Would you send them a text? Would you actually pick up the phone and call them? Do you have their phone number? Or would it be in an email? So in my residency program, we did this exercise of name three people. And I told the residents, if you can't fill up your three-person list, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. It's a red flag to what's going on in your life. And then I told them, if you don't have three people, or at least three people. Put myself, and I put my telephone number up on the screen, make sure that I'm one of your people. And this is extremely important for you to take back to your shop, is that you need to make sure that all of your coworkers and your colleagues know that they have at least one other person that they can go to. And so, I, again, you know, I felt like, okay, this is like a little hokey thing. I was trying to touch at their emotions and or whatever. Um, but within weeks of doing this session, I had a phone call. With, within weeks, each year that I've done this session, within weeks, I get a phone call. I get a, you know, can you please come to my apartment? I broke up my girlfriend and I have no idea what to do. Or uh, I got a phone call that says that my spouse is abusing me and I need somewhere to stay. And I have no one else to call, literally. And they said, specifically, I went to my three-person list and I had no one. Or I only had one other person that I could call and I, they're tired of me complaining. So I added you to the list. Many people that go through suicide or suicidal ideation, thoughts, the reason why they actually go through with it is because they have no one to vent to. They feel secluded and isolated. And oftentimes, some of these people are, you know, even put out from the residency program because they're not doing well, and they end up going on remediation or probation. And then that really pulls them away from the pack, right? The only time they actually were able to socialize was at work, and now they're not at work. So you need to make sure that everyone at your program feels like they have someone to talk to. Make sure that you're at least that third person on their list. 
It's a huge, huge level of responsibility, but you will thank yourself afterwards for doing it. Any questions, comments, stories? So I really hope that you guys can take these worksheets back to your shop. Do a little 15 minute segment talk or session with each of your groups. Maybe you can split it up into PGY levels so that it's a little bit more intimate. But this is extremely important. It's not about just talking about the burnout and about the statistics, but trying to really talk about ways that you can prevent it and making sure that everyone feels like they have a support system. We are pretty rough on ourselves as physicians. We think that we're immoral, but we all go through life, right? Particularly these stages in residency where you are having children, getting married, getting divorced. It's a very you know, tumultuous time in your life period. So if you're there for each other, that's the best thing that you can do outside of you know, getting someone to seek professional help. All right, thanks everyone.